Hello, welcome to today's um, today's live video. Today we're talking about the butterfly habitat for for your yard, how to make your your garden a butterfly sanctuary by providing nectar and providing host plants, and also how to discourage the butterflies you don't want in your garden, like the ones that make the green worms that eat our um, that eat our cabbages and get lodged in our broccoli flowers. So that's what we're talking about today. And um, today I'm coming live over Zoom to you as always. And uh, <clears throat> I have a bit of a frog in my throat, so hopefully that won't interfere. Um, this week is Pollinator Week, International Pollinator Week. It started on Monday, it goes through till Sunday. And every day we've been um, playing a bit of a game about um, sharing some fun facts about pollinators and pollinator habitat and uh, asking you to go look for things and share them in the group with our scavenger hunt. There's also a scavenger bingo you can play inside the Facebook group. And uh, while we play and have fun, we're also learning about pollinators, the importance they are to the ecosystem. Um, over 50% of our food would disappear if it wasn't for pollinators. And so we wanna do what we can to encourage them in our, in our gardens because the habitat is disappearing for them. Um, a lot of their host plants are disappearing, their food sources are disappearing. And when it comes to butterflies, it's very important because the host plants to butterflies are very specific. If there is a loss of milkweed, for instance, we don't have monarch butterflies. They don't, they don't lay their eggs on other plants. Milkweed is their host plant. Um, and as you probably already know, monarch butterflies um, migrate from Mexico into North America. And then after the young are hatched, those young fly all the way back to Mexico. So it's very important that they can find their host plant in that little window of time they have. Um, now they do take nectar from other plants, but that butterfly host plant is the only one that they can lay their eggs on. So it's very important that those monarch butterflies can quickly find a milkweed plant when it's time for them to lay their eggs. And they have a very small window to do so. Now, when we're talking about host plants, there are some butterflies that um, we don't necessarily want to provide host plants for because we eat those host plants and we don't want them um, eating them before we get to them. For instance, the cabbage moth butterfly. The cabbage or the cabbage butterfly, or sometimes it's called the cabbage moth, um, and it likes to eat brassica plants. So that would be um, our cabbages, our cauliflower, our broccoli, um, maybe um, even radishes, although I haven't seen them on radishes so much. Nasturtium flowers as well. Um, they're actually the uh, same family as brassica, although they've, they've changed their, um, their name. Um, because they don't have some of the brassica characteristics, but the butterflies recognize them as the same. And so they will lay their eggs also on the nasturtium flowers. Um, I'm gonna share with you how to discourage those bad um, butterflies. Um, of course, it depends on whether you want them or not, right? Whether they're good or bad. But I'm gonna share with you how to discourage the bad ones, how to encourage the good ones. So let's get started. Um, now, the most important thing that you need to have butterflies, to, to create a butterfly sanctuary, is there needs to be nectary plants. Yesterday, we talked a bit about just a general providing pollinators uh, with the right habitat. And what we shared yesterday, or sorry, Wednesday, is the same for butterflies as it is for bees and other pollinators. They need to have a source of nectar. Now they don't necessarily lay their eggs in the nectar, nectary plants. So um, if you go into the Facebook group, um, you will find a list of nectary plants. Those are not butterfly host plants. Those are, those are plants that butterflies need to, um, the adult butterflies to, to get the nectar so that they can have enough energy in order to breed. Um, one, one time, um, I, I went out into the garden and we, we have 140 acres here and a lot of it is just rewilded land and, and there are a lot of thistles growing. And just on the other side of my garden, 
there was an area where there was a large patch of thistle. Now it's gone now, but um, on that time there was a large patch of thistle and the thistle was in bloom. And then normally I would have whacked it down with a weed whacker before it went to flower, but I didn't because when I looked at that patch of thistles that was in bloom, there was hundreds and hundreds of painted lady butterflies on those thistles feeding off the nectar. And so we left the thistles and until they, they had basically gone to seed before we, we removed them. Um, of course, that was just one patch of thistles. We had others that they could lay their eggs on. Um, but the significant thing is a lot of the plants that we might think we don't want in our garden, if you have a small yard, you, you don't. But if you have a large acreage, you might wanna leave a little bit of area to rewild even with thistles so that the butterflies have a place for nectar. Um, so the four things we wanna provide for butterflies to create a butterfly sanctuary, we wanna provide some cover. Uh, butterflies are very um, vulnerable to being snatched by a bird and eaten. And so we wanna provide places, um, maybe some trees, um, maybe some uh, large flowering plants where they can get under the leaves, under the flowers and hide from birds. Um, so that's very important. Uh, the other thing we wanna provide is um, nectar producing plants, which I mentioned already. Now, some of those are things like echinacea, um, milkweed, butterfly weed, um, thistles, as I mentioned, uh, sunflowers um, and a lot of the same things that we provide for bees, we can use for butterflies. Um, bees often don't so much like legumes, but butterflies do actually like legumes and will drink the nectar from legume flowers. Um, the one thing about butterflies is they don't require the same pollen that, um, that bees require. So they don't feed it to their young, they don't eat the pollen. So we can provide flowers um, that might not have, that have nectary glands, but don't have pollen. For instance, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it. So I'll skip that. There are quite a few flowers though that are bred for the florist trade that don't have pollen because that's not great for, for florist flowers, and so, but they still provide nectar. And so those are great ones for butterflies. Um, and, um, hollyhock is another good one for butterflies. It has a lot of nectar and a lot of flowers. And also any of those plants with really tiny flowers like yarrow, um, lavender, uh, rosemary, mint, um, that family where there's very, very tiny flowers. Um, butterflies love that. They have a long proboscis that can get, that's, the, that's sort of their tongue. A, it's called the proboscis and they have a long proboscis that can get right into the nectary gland of the flower to draw up the flower. Bee balm is another one that has a lot of nectar that's very attractive to butterflies. Um, and pretty much any mint family plant. So if you have, um, so bee balm, um, lavender, sage, all of those are mint family plants and they are great plants for butterflies as well. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that butterflies need is water, and that would be a safe source of water. Um, as, as a farmer, we have, we have animals, um, you know, chickens or goats, in the past we did, and sheep, and we would have like a water bucket for them. And very often we go out in the morning and there'd be a butterfly drowning in the bucket. Um, often we were able to save them by scooping them out and putting them in a place where they could dry, but sometimes it was too late. And really butterflies, if they're provided with a shallow pan of water and some wood or some rocks where they can stand on it to drink, then they won't go into the water pails. They will choose the safe source. They only go into the water pails when there's no other source of water. So they really need um, a safe one. Well, what I do is I, I took an old frying pan of mine that a uh, stainless steel frying pan that didn't have a handle anymore. And I just put it um, in a garden bed and put some pieces of wood and, and rocks in. And I just go and fill that up. Um, the other thing I have is a bucket that has a floating fountain and they will stand on the fountain 
and um, drink. It only works, it, it's a solar fountain. It only works if the sun's actually on it. So most of the time it's not active and the butterflies and the bees will stand on that and drink as well. Um, and the fourth thing that they need is host plants. Um, a host plant is not necessarily one that produces nectar, but one that has leaves that their, their babies can eat. And this is pretty important because butterflies are specific to certain host plants, like the cabbage butterfly only lays its eggs on brassica plants, for instance. Um, a host plant is where the butterfly lays its eggs and the caterpillars eat. Um, so, of course, we already know that monarch butterflies only lay their eggs on milkweed plants. So if we want to encourage monarchs, we need to have milkweed plants in our area. Now, if you live in an area that doesn't have monarchs, like in the West, we don't, in British Columbia, I have never actually seen a monarch, even though I've seen milkweed growing. Um, but I've seen lots of monarchs back east. And so if you live where there aren't any monarchs, planting milkweed might probably isn't going to attract them because uh, they're not in our area, right? Um, but learn what butterflies are in your area and then consider if you have enough land to encourage some of the host plants of those ones. Um, for instance, swallowtail butterflies. Uh, swallowtail butterflies use fennel parsley, dill, Queen Anne's lace, those, those kinds of Apiaceae family plants. And so you wanna, you might wanna plant some and just sacrifice it to the butterflies. Um, now, if you need to know that if you provide a plant to the butterfly host, there are going to be worms on that plant, caterpillars, and they're gonna consume the plant. So if you have um, some, some plants that you can sacrifice and some that are for your own food, that works great. Um, now, as I said, fennel, parsley, dill, and Queen Anne's lace. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because we're going to talk about another use of dill and fennel in your garden in just a minute that has to do with butterflies. So the swallowtail butterfly really relishes those fennel, dill, parsley, um, and some of, those, some of the wild plants in that family as well. Um, Fritillary butterflies like thistles, violets, um, violas, um, and also um, passion vine, and they will lay their eggs on that. So again, if you want to encourage fritillary butterflies, you may want to have some plants that you can sacrifice um, and allow them to lay their eggs. The giant silk moths, um, I don't know if you've seen them. Uh, they usually uh, fly at night, not so much during the day, but they can be this big. And they're, they're absolutely beautiful. And they lay their eggs on in the forest, on alder and willow, birch, poplar, wild cherry, those kinds of, and their, their um, caterpillars get quite large before they form their chrysalis. So if you have them in your area, then the trees that they, they, they actually, their host plant is a tree. And so if you have wild forests around you, you wanna encourage those trees. If, if they're clear cutting where you are and knocking down the weed trees, as well as the, um, and that happens sometimes, they're actually taking away the habitat for those um, giant silk moths. The morning cloak, butterfly is a black butterfly with azure um, colored dots on, on the wings. And it also uses the same host trees as the giant silk moths, a uh, willow, birch, aspen, cottonwood, and also elm trees. Painted lady butterflies um, like hollyhock and mallow and marshmallow, as well as um, interestingly enough, legumes. So that would be your clovers and your vetches and your lupins and uh, thistles as well. They're, they're not as specific as a butterfly like a monarch. Um, and also they will lay their eggs on sunflowers. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, make sure that these, the butterflies um, that you're thinking you want to attract actually are in your area before you invest the money and the time into planting specific host plants. Now, there are many, um, butterflies and many different host plants. 
um, these are the main ones that are around me that I've mentioned. And again, we don't have monarchs, but monarchs um, are often mentioned uh, when you're talking about butterfly host plants. Let's talk about discouraging pests. Now, one of the things I came across this one actually by accident. Um, one day or one year, I, I happened to plant a couple of dill seeds in a row with my, um, with my broccoli. And I, it was a, accidental as in I had planted it, it didn't come up. So I replanted the row with broccoli. And the, um, the dill plants came up with the broccoli plants. And that year I didn't have any trouble at all with cabbage butterfly. Now it turns out that the dill plants, they only flower in the same year. And those dill flowers actually attract predatory wasps and predatory wasps, they don't sting people, but they're a wasp with a very narrow waist um, kind of long. And what they do is they seek out those caterpillars and they lay their eggs in the caterpillar. And when their eggs hatch, they, um, the larva consume the caterpillar. And so you don't have any more cabbage butterflies. The other thing it does is the strong smell of the dill confuses the cabbage butterflies so they don't lay as many eggs. They go look for another host. Now, what I have found is that um, I have to put the dill in the same row or the same bed as the plant. I can't kind of put it on the outside of the garden and think that that's gonna work. That's great for providing um, swallowtail butterflies with host plants, but it's not so great for discouraging cabbage butterflies. Um, so what I found is that I need to plant uh, when I do my row of cabbage or little cauliflower, I put the dill seed in at the same time in that row. Um, the other thing, surprisingly, is that the very small slugs avoid the rows that have the dill as well. So you're kind of getting a double protection there. Um, the, other the other way to discourage is to provide kind of a decoy crop. So in the case of cabbage butterfly, you can plant nasturtiums on the outside of your garden and that will attract the cabbage butterfly and she'll lay her eggs in your nasturtiums. Um, and ants actually use nasturtiums as well for um, aphids. And so it's kind of a decoy crop and they'll leave your um, cabbages and your broccoli alone if you do that. Um, the other way is to confuse their pheromones. They, they find their plants by scent. And so if you can confuse their pheromones, they will avoid your crop. And we do that often with onions or garlic planted either um, around your bed where you have the, um, the plant you're trying to protect or directly within the bed. Um, with cabbage hornworm, people will often plant basil um, alternating basil, tomato plant, basil, tomato plant, for the same reason, to discourage the tomato hornworm um, moth from laying its eggs on the tomatoes. Um, and then speaking of tomato hornworm moth, there is another moth whose larva looks very similar. That's not a tomato hornworm, and it's the hawkworm or hawk moth worm. And the hawk moth worm actually um, turns into a hummingbird moth, which is a very pretty moth that has, has kind of a fuzzy B-shaped body um, and then lace wings. And the hummingbird moth prefers rose type plants. So that would be like your apple trees, your hawthorn trees, uh, rose bushes, those kinds of plants. So if you are going around and you find um, a large worm, um, and you go, what is this tomato hornworm doing in my apple tree like I did last year? Um, that is not a tomato hornworm, even though it looks like it. It's actually a hummingbird moth worm. And all you need to do is just move it to another plant in the rose family that you're not so concerned about, like, like a wild hawthorn tree or a wild um, Saskatoon tree. And it will happily feed on that tree instead. And then you preserve your uh, hummingbird moths, and you'll start to see them the next spring. So we have talked about um, nectar producing flowers, the need for nectar producing flowers, the need to provide cover and hiding spots, 
so that you can protect your butterflies from being eaten by birds. Um, the need for, for adding nectar producing flowers, and a lot of those are our, are our medicinal herbs like um, mint family plants and echinacea and, and um, butterfly, well, butterfly weeds, not a medicinal herb, but those kinds of plants um, and providing a safe source of water that has a place for them to um, kind of um, not drown, a shallow dish of water with places for them to stand so that they don't drown in the water and then host plants. So hi, Kathy, thanks for joining me. Kathy says, we have swallowtail here in Washington state. I planted milkweed as I read that monarchs do come around, but there's no food for them, I think. I saw a monarch, but not sure. It looked like a picture I had. Okay, that's good to know. I, I personally haven't seen any, but I'm in the mountains and I don't see why there wouldn't be monarchs um, if there's milkweed around. I've just never seen them. So it's good to know that you've seen them. Um, so if there's any questions, um, some, some great books uh, to check out um, are the field guides to butterflies. And um, it's just so that you can identify the butterfly. Once you know the, what butterflies you have around, you know which, you can look up which host plants to provide for them if you wanna do that. Um, if you have a small yard, you might just wanna provide the nectar and expect that if you're seeing butterflies, they'll find their host plant somewhere else. Um, and again, really important to know how to discourage the ones you don't want. Um, so for me, the main one is the cabbage butterfly. They're all over the place here. Um, and, and they're the ones I'm mostly bothered with. And I, I have found that just planting dill in the same row solves my problem. Um, so I hope you found that helpful. It is National Pollinator Week and we have a scavenger hunt game going on. And to participate, you just need to go actually to the group because it's not going to show up um, probably in your feed. Um, every morning we're, we're posting a new um, item to go look for and to take a picture of and to share. And um, we're giving points for that. And we're going to have a quiz on Monday. Uh, we have one more Facebook Live coming up on Sunday. And then on Monday, there's a quiz. And then um, at some point, we'll post a leaderboard to show everybody where uh, they are sitting on the leaderboard. Uh, there's been some really interesting discussions in the group about pollinators and about plants for pollinators. Um, and it's really interesting to hear what other people's experiences are. So if you are interested um, heading into the group, um, not in your Facebook feed, but directly in the group, you can read the, you can see what people are sharing and read their comments about what's happening in their garden with pollinators. All right, so there doesn't seem to be any more questions coming in. Thanks for joining me. Oh, Kathy does have a question um, or a statement. I have a bird bath that we put rocks in for the butterflies and bees to land on and get a drink without drowning. That's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, a bird bath is a great idea. All right. Have a good weekend. I'll talk to you again on Sunday. Bye-bye.